Hello out there in YouTube land. My name is Timothy Connolly, and today we are welcoming you once again to the Ringo Klecko Sports Report. And I am joined here by Ringo Klecko. Say hello, Ringo Klecko. Rock and roll, everybody. It's Ringo Klecko. That's right. And Ringo Klecko is all about sports, as am I. And we are here to bring you the latest and greatest in the American professional sports news. Starting off with the NFL. <clears throat> Big news. Well, there's an article that popped up this week on BleedingGreenNation.com. And the article is titled, Four Insane Ideas to Change the NFL. Not four ideas to change the NFL, mind you, but four insane ideas to change the NFL. And it also goes on to say as a tagline, introduce a little anarchy. Well, BleedingGreenNation.com is a site that's uh, semi-affiliated with the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, we're going to take a look at this article written by Dave Mangles. And um, he's got some ideas. Uh, and he starts off his article by saying, we are in the slowest part of the NFL offseason. So why not throw around some absolutely crazy ideas that will never happen? Okay. Well, the first of his ideas is realign the league. Um, he goes on to say here that an NFL realignment wouldn't be about money. It would be about entertainment. The league's divisional and conference structure has been unchanged since the Texans entered the league in 2002. Rivalries have gotten a little stale since then. Eagles, Cowboys, one of the biggest rivalries in the sport, hasn't been an actual big game in years. They've either played so early in the season to make the impact feel minimal or later in the season when key starters have been missing or rested. Hmm. Ringo Klecko, what do you think about a realignment of the National Football League? Well, I think that, uh, how you doing, mate? Uh, uh, Commissioner Roger Goodell, ever since he's taken over, he's done everything he could to destroy the league. So I think that this is just another step in doing that. When it ain't broke, don't fix it, unless, of course, you're Roger Goodell, when you got to make it less and less like the great football, American football that Howard Cosell and John Lennon saw when the Rams played the uh, the uh, the Washington football team. They used to be called something else back in 1974 in Los Angeles. Um, it all goes back to when, uh, you know, John wrote and uh, we recorded uh, Revolution, uh, that was one of the toughest, most powerful sounding records that the Beatles had made. Um, and uh, then when they made the Red and the Blue albums in 1973, uh, Apple uh, and Capitol, they remixed it in stereo. And uh, John Lennon said that they had turned this really tough, ballsy song into a bucket of melted ice cream. And that's basically what this realignment is. This is just straight uh, from uh, 555 Fifth Avenue, the home and, uh, and office of Commissioner Roger Goodell. Uh, anything that's good about the league, he wants to destroy it and... Uh, he, uh, he doesn't hesitate to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. Good points, Ringo Klecko. Well, David here at this site also goes on to say, change the way the salary cap works. Every league with a salary cap has their own specific rules. So let's borrow a few of those. Part one, designated players. The NBA, NHL, and MLS have limits on how much of the salary cap a single player can earn. 25% for the NBA, 20% for the NHL, and 12.5% for Major League Soccer. Now, the NFL has no such limit. At some point, it could be ugly. Top quarterbacks are not going to agree to not get more than their peers did, so the end of the escalation is not going to come from the player's side. The simplest and most realistic solution is an NBA-style max contract. 20% of the salary cap, but fully guaranteed. For 2023 would be $45 million guaranteed, but that's not as much fun as we could get from fixing this potential issue. He also goes on to say that players get their money, everyone else gets their talking points. Ringo Klecko, what do you have to say about that idea? Well, there is a rookie cal uh, salary cap uh, and a salary structure, as you know. Um, I don't know that this is what... That's what they're talking about, but uh, it seems like they failed to mention it. Also, um, whether there's going to be players that are paid more than the top quarterbacks, that's probably not going to happen as well. As you know, uh, Roger Goodell has taken, like we said earlier, uh, the old school football and turned it into basically like a pinball machine. It's offense, 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 offense. And that means a quarterback. So, uh, you know, the appreciated value of the running backs and obviously the, the top defensive players, they're not going to get as much as the quarterback. Uh, it, it all sounds to me like, uh, 
when uh, Phil Spector took the get back sessions and he put all the strings on uh, long and winding road and, uh, and such, uh, that's basically what's going on with this. They, uh, they just want to dress it up and make it up all more uh, Nancy like, and uh, you know, let the players play, make their money, and uh, and uh, get, keep the league going. Interesting. And uh, also, David goes on to here to suggest that uh, you could have the cap space be allowable to be traded. So allow cap space to be traded sounds insane, right? Well, this one isn't that crazy because other sports essentially already do this. In the NHL, a team trading away a player can retain up to half of the player's contract. And in Major League Soccer, there is a pool of money. It's not actually money that teams can use to trade straight up for players or draft picks, or they can use it to reduce a player's cap hit, but not their earnings. In the National Basketball Association, you can straight up swap a draft pick for cash. So sending money in trades has happened for decades. <clears throat> and in the Major League Baseball, it's uh, happened for decades and in the National Hockey League as well. Babe Ruth and Wayne Gretzky, as a matter of fact, were both traded in deals that involved a monetary amount. Now, we've already seen trades in the NFL where teams eat dead money in exchange for draft picks. Most famously, the Cleveland Browns giving up a fourth rounder to the Texans for Brock Osweiler a second and a seventh. Osweiler never played a down for them. The Browns simply bought a second round pick. More recently, we've seen teams restructuring an outgoing player's contract to take on a dead cap hit in order to get a good draft pick in return, such as what the Chicago Bears did when they traded Robert Quinn to the Philadelphia Eagles for a fourth rounder. But Ringo Klecko, what do you have to say about this? Well, I think the opportunity to uh, make trades, that's, that's something that uh, would make a lot of sense. Obviously, uh, Herman Edwards, the uh, the football coach of the supposed football Jets, uh, he was traded uh, to Kansas City for a fourth round draft pick, which turned into uh, running back kick return of Leon Washington. So there have been things that have been a little out of the box. Obviously, that's permitted by the Constitution, a little note codicil of the National Football League. Uh, these would be new uh, rules which would have to be uh, voted on by the Board of Governors that would require a 75% uh, yay in order to pass. Um, as you know, with uh, the moving of uh, uh, the, the restructuring of uh, the kickoff returns, uh, that was narrowly approved. I think there were uh, seven or eight donors that said no. Um, so this could think kind of thing could come up. Um, I do know that uh, when John and Paul were discussing, uh, you know, whether to uh, keep George Harrison out of uh, the Lennon McCartney uh, songwriting partnership, uh, that they discussed uh, fundamentally it was about money. It wasn't about George as a Beatle or George as a person or George as a friend. It was the fact that uh, 100 divided by two is 50 and 100 divided by three is less than 50. Makes sense. And uh, also another point here that's raised is what about making an actual developmental league for the NFL? He goes on to write, this is insane because owners will never go for it. The benefits to the league for player development are obvious, of course. As to why the NFL doesn't ju just let the XFL and USFL use their players, <clears throat> it's because the NFL Players Association will not allow their members to participate in non-NFL games. The league has had some minor interest in being part uh, or being a part investor, I should say, in a spring league. They basically told the Alliance of American Football to check back with them in a few years. But the league folded midway through their first year in 2019. Remember that? I sure do. But the uh, owners don't want to put up the money for a fully owned spring league. And that's a big reason why they closed NFL Europe. <clears throat> they didn't want to pay for it, but uh, times have changed since then. Live TV is a huge moneymaker. You know that, Ringo Klecko, and so do I. In fact, the, the XFL and the USFL, believe it or not, they average over 600,000 viewers for their games. And that's not a ton, but that's more than an average Major League Soccer game or uh, an, a an afternoon college football game. So not bad for two competing leagues with players that most viewers have no knowledge of and teams that nobody has any real connection with. What do you think, Ringo Klecko? Developmental League? Well, it's all about the brand identity, mate. It's all about defending the shield of the National Football League. And I do think that is a, a very true point that you've made, that uh, they don't want to get their NFL players uh, playing for anybody else. 
Uh, now, whether they are playing for somebody else before uh, they get to the National Football League, and that's something else is sponsored by the National Football League, whether it's the World League or the World League of American Football, or even basically college football, which is not uh, directly associated with the National Football League, but is effectively the farm, the minor leagues of football. But if you then have people that are already in the band going off and uh, off with another entity, well, then that uh, that takes away from the uniformity of uh, of what they have. Obviously, when uh, the Beatles were recording. She said, she said, and, uh, and Paul famously uh, uh, walked out of the Ab uh, Abbey Road. Um, and then George had ended up playing bass on that song. Uh, Paul went right to the bag of nails and uh, had a very long conversation with Jimi Hendrix and came very close to uh, going up to, uh, to New York State with Jimi Hendrix and uh, recording with Jimi Hendrix and Miles Davis. Well, that would be like uh, the national. That would be like half of the Jets team uh, going off and playing for uh, I don't know the uh, the the Tucson uh, termites. That you know they would not be welcome back to uh, the greatest of all time, whether it's the Beatles or the Jets. No, that's right. No one escapes the Tucson termites unscathed. And that's a good point you raised there too, with regards to this and. Um... College football is indeed effectively the uh, <clears throat> the minor league system, farm system, whatever you want to call it, for the NFL. And um, <clears throat> but uh, they are indeed two separate entities, and uh, it probably should stay that way. Another insane idea that comes up in this article is eliminate the draft. And he goes on to say, well, this one will never ever happen without the federal government declaring drafts illegal which would throw American and Canadian sports into complete chaos for a few years. But let's assume for a moment that the NFL draft was eliminated for whatever reason. What would happen? Well, one benefit is that it could completely eliminate tanking. Now, tanking isn't much of an issue in the NFL as it is in other sports, but it exists. And with no better draft picks to play for, there's no reason for a team to not try to compete, which opens everything up for everyone. What do you think, Ringo Klecko? Well, the counter argument to that is that these players, they have a very short uh, careers, whether it's running backs or or even uh, players, uh, uh, skilled positions. They're not going to play very long. By the time they're 40, they're probably done. Um, so they're not going to take a whole one seventeenth of their regular season and, and tank the season. Uh, it, it, it might uh, behoove them to do so, but the famous examples where, uh, you know, Rex Ryan against the Tennessee Titans when he was a coach of the Jets, uh, he could have lost that game, but he knew that he was getting fired and uh, he knew that he'd be screwing it to the Jets by winning that game and then worsening their draft position. You know, this thing kind of goes on and on and on. Um, so I don't know that eliminating the draft, I don't know, you know, the draft has been there since the mid 60s. Uh, baseball has incorporated it at that time as well. Uh, before then, uh, they would be the, uh, the the owners with the money. They would be the ones that would offer the bonus contracts and get the best players. Um, and then you'd have the second division teams. Um, I think that with this system, you still have second division teams. Uh, you know, we could live to be a, a billion years old, a trillion years old, whatever comes after that. Uh, the New York Jets are never going to be able to win anything. Yeah. Well, after trillion comes quadrillion, and I don't think the Jets are going to be winning in a Super Bowl uh, even within that time frame. <clears throat> I kid, I kid. There yeah, must be drafted, parody uh, in the we, league. We drafted Ringo out, out from Butlin's uh, out of the Hurricanes in 1962, um, and there had been a uh, you know some kind of draft, and maybe uh, Jerry and the pacemakers could have blocked it, you know. And then uh, who'd be playing drums for us? Uh, I don't know. Would it be uh, Jane Asher? I wouldn't mind that at all, mate. I wouldn't have minded seeing that either. <clears throat> but of course, yeah, as you know, uh, things uh, turned out the way that they did. And um, and that's all she wrote for this NFL segment here today at the Ringo Klecko Sports Report. And moving right along, it's time for some Major League Baseball news. There's big news coming out of Cincinnati, Ohio. And apparently, uh, well, according to MLB.com's big article that hit the interwebs yesterday, talking about this kid. Ellie De La Cruz. He is supposed to make his MLB debut on Tuesday. That's coming right up after this weekend. <clears throat> and um, I beg your pardon, actually made his uh, debut this past Tuesday. <laughs> Never mind. He was called up. He made his Major League debut this past Tuesday. And according to MLB.com, this new phenom hits like Aaron Judge, runs like Trey Turner, and throws like no other. 
Interesting. And it goes on to say here that his debut was immediately electric and his follow-up act on Wednesday was even more spectacular. In fact, downright freaky is the words that his teammate Will Benson used to describe his performance. After only just three days of the majors, De La Cruz has the Cincinnati Reds' two hardest hit balls of the year, their longest home run, and the fastest triple of the Major League Baseball season. And uh, it also goes on to say, here are nine ridiculous feats that the 21-year-old slugging infielder has already pulled off this season in the majors and the minors. Number one, his first monster career home run, 450 feet, 114.8 miles per hour off the bat. Number two, hardest first career home run under StatCast tracking, which uh, has been a thing since at least 2017, as far as I know. But um, hardest first career home run under StatCast tracking. The hardest is number one, Jake Berger, 115.2 miles per hour. That is from July 17th, 2021. And then, of course, we have Ellie De La Cruz's home run this week. Now, also, the fastest triple of the year. Okay. 10.83 10.83 seconds from home to third base. That's the fastest home to third time this season in the majors. My oh my. Also, <clears throat> elite sprint speeds in every big league game. He ripped a 112 mile per hour double for his first career hit. In his second game, there was the 30.9 feet per second triple. And in his third game on Thursday, he beat out an infield single with a sprint speed from home to first of 30.9 feet per second why this guy isn't running in the olympics i have no idea also he has hit 115 plus mile per hour home runs from both sides of the plate in the same game now i don't even know what to say about that i'm a little bit speechless there also three 116 plus mile per hour extra base hits in that same game oh boy also ellie de la cruz has the hardest hit ball and the hardest hit home run in the minors all year so far now he also has hit five home runs that have been clocked at 116 plus miles per hour this season amazing he also from the infield showed off his elite arm strength by throwing a 100 0.2 0.2 miles per hour throw across the baseball diamond. No infielder has a 100 miles per hour throw in a major league baseball game that has <clears throat> ever been tracked by StatCast. Also, this guy has multiple 99 miles per hour assists. He has to be seen to be believed. What do you make of this Ellie De La Cruz gentleman there, Ringo Klecko? Well, mate, it's uh, wonderful to uh, get off to such a rock and start, uh, whether you're uh, Mark the Bird Fidrich in 1976 or Greg Jeffries in 1988 or Ellie De La Cruz in uh, the year of our Lord, 2023. But the question is, can you sustain it? Can you do it again and again and again and be the best of all time again and again and again? Uh, first two guys I mentioned, they were uh, basically one hit wonders, one year and out. Uh, of uh, that level of play. And uh, maybe this uh, Ellie De La Cruz um, is going to be uh, the next Ken Griffey Jr. and do it for 25 years. Uh, time will tell. But uh, I do think it's significant about the fact that when uh, – John Lennon famously went to Spain with uh, Brian Epstein for a holiday uh, that they stayed at the house of uh, Mr. Epstein's uh, dear friend, Ellie de la Cruz. And I wonder if there's any uh, connection there, whether uh, it's a descendant of uh, Mr. Cruz, uh, the elder, or uh, whether he was named in honor of uh, the Chateau there in Barcelona, where uh, uh, Brian Epstein and John Lennon may or may not have done stuff. I wonder about that myself, Ringo Klecko. And uh, just taking a quick peek at the uh, National League Central standings, I do see that the Cincinnati Reds are <clears throat> one, two, three, four, five games below 500. They've got a win loss record of 29 and 34, and they are currently in third place in their division, five games behind the division leading Milwaukee Brewers. It remains to be seen if this Ellie De La Cruz guy can help propel the Reds up in through the standings to perhaps take their division 
and uh, but they've uh, got some work cut out for them. So we'll see what happens with that. And uh, I can only wish the Cincinnati Reds luck. Now, we've been getting some listener mail here at the show, and it's, of course, time to take a look at a couple of these emails, and let's see what we can uh, do in the way of answering them for the listeners out there who were kind enough to write them in. But before we have a look at these letters, I just would like to remind all of our viewers and all of our listeners that anytime you have questions, sports-related, please, they can be sent to our program director, Sonny Calzone. Just send your emails to sonnycalzone.com. I'm sorry, it's not sonnycalzone.com. Send your letters to sonnycalzone at gmail.com. There we go. And just put Ringo Klecko Sports Report in the subject line of your email. And then, of course, write us your letter. And we will get to it on the show if you are lucky. In the meantime, these two lucky listeners have sent us in some letters. The first one is Don Pacheco from Munster, Indiana. And Don writes in, is Mike Ditka a hermaphrodite like that actress? Interesting question, Don. I never thought about this before. Uh, Ringo Klecko, what do you make of this? Well, I, I don't know anything about that, mate. I do know that uh, in the month of June that uh, it, it's uh, people are revealing their uh, their sexual statuses more and more and more. Uh, but uh, Mr. Mike Ditka, uh, he seems to be, uh, he is what he uh, presents himself to be, which is a, uh, a former uh, Hall of Fame tight end for uh, the Chicago Bears and the Dallas Cowboys. <clears throat> Obviously, he's, uh, he's big catch in uh, Super Bowl uh, six against uh, the Miami Dolphins when the Cowboys beat them up 24 to three. Uh, that was uh, very much a, a statement that uh, he only had uh, male reproductive organs and was not in possession of any female reproduction or organs. Uh, this question always comes down to a sense of androgyny. You know, uh, when the Beatles were uh, wearing their leather suits uh, up until uh, mid-1962, uh, they were not only uh, uh, attracting uh, girls, but they were attracting boys. And, uh, you know, the uh, the the uh, they were being uh, questioned as to whether, well, what does that mean that they are hermaphrodites? And they said, no, we're the Beatles. And I think that, that put that question to rest. And I think they weren't just speaking about themselves. They were speaking about Mike Ditka. I see. I reckon you're right about that. And well, Don, I hope that answers your letter. It certainly answered the question for me. Thank you, Ringo Klecko. And we've got another letter here that came in from inmate 49387XY5 at the Federal Correction Institution in Danbury, Connecticut. And this inmate wants to know, why did the Chariots of Fire movie about the 1924 Olympics take place at the 1924 Olympics and not at another Olympics? I would have liked to have seen Franz Klammer integrated into that storyline wearing billowy shorts. Ringo Klecko? Well, you know, it's uh it's it's very well very well, well famously known that uh when uh, Paul McCartney and uh, Mal Evans were flying back from I think it was from uh from Germany to uh to England uh that uh that mail had uh had a little, little thing that said S on it, a little thing that said P on it. And uh, he said to Paul, he goes, what, what is uh, what, what does S and P stand for? And obviously it was, uh, it was salt and pepper, they thought. But uh, in that moment, Paul McCartney thought about the 1924 Olympics <clears throat> with the billowy shorts and the 1976 Winter Olympics with Franz Klammer and his famous gold medal uh, run in the downhill when he almost fell down about 17 different times, not wearing billowy shorts at all. He said, well, let's uh, let's put on our own uh figurative billowy shorts and uh, not be the Beatles on our next record. Let's be a completely different band. And he came up with Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So I think that, uh, that inmate, uh, as you say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, exclamation point in Danbury, Connecticut, uh, when he's not breaking rocks, he's probably meditating on all the great music that he's listened to in his life, his former life as a free person, and uh, thought about that uh, the Sergeant Pepper's record uh, was really about these Olympians that you're talking about. That's astonishing. I never knew that the Sgt. Pepper album was inspired by the 1924 Olympics. Is that true, Ringo Klecker, or are you just jerking our chain? I don't know that expression, mate, but I do know that all of my uh, all of my sources and all my facts are, are double double fact checked and uh, for veracity and rectitude at all times. And also, Excellent. they rock. far be it from me to doubt you, mate. 
All right. Very good. Well, that concludes <clears throat> our listener mail segment. <clears throat> Inmate in Danbury, Connecticut. I trust we answered your question. And moving right along. Up next here, we've got some NBA news. And it looks like ESPN.com is reporting that Chris Paul is talking with the Phoenix Suns about his future with the franchise. And it looks like Chris Paul might be staying in Phoenix, although we don't know just yet. They've just recently made a big coaching change, bringing Frank Vogel aboard to replace the former New York Knickerbocker Monty Williams. And uh, ESPN.com uh, goes on to say here that the Phoenix Suns ownership and executives had a series of conversations with Chris Paul and his representatives on the all-star point guard's future with the franchise, including the possibility that he could be waived by the NBA's June 28 guarantee date on his contract. Now, the Suns insist that they are still working through several possibilities for Chris Paul's future, and they reiterated that to his representatives later Wednesday afternoon, just earlier this week. Phoenix does plan to explore trade opportunities, including Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton, that could alter the franchise's roster landscape ahead of a final decision on Paul's partially guaranteed contract. Now, um, this article also goes on to say that Chris Paul continues to want to return to the Phoenix Suns and remain partnered with his close friend, Devin Booker, and also Kevin Durant. Nevertheless, Chris Paul and his representatives want the organization to make a quicker decision on his future so that he can proceed out into free agency if indeed the Phoenix Suns ultimately waive him. So, Ringo Klecko, what do you make of this situation involving Chris Paul and the Phoenix Suns? Well, I think it all makes a lot of sense. I mean, he calls himself Chris Paul. Uh, uh, James Paul McCartney called himself Paul uh, because uh, his middle name was Paul. And here we have Chris Paul. Is, is, apparently, his middle name is Paul as well. Uh, so I think that the, uh, the, syn the syncopation there between the Chris Paul and the James Paul, if you say it about a trillion times in your head, will uh, come clear. So all the answers to your questions there. I do know that uh, that Paul, uh, by all pretenses, was with uh, Jane uh, Asher. Uh, uh, shortly at the time, he uh, he broke up with Dot Roan uh, in 1962. Uh, all the way through uh, 1968, he then moved on to Francis Schwartz and then to Linda Eastman. And I think that in the same way that uh, that uh, James Paul considered himself a free agent, I think that Chris Paul is looking at that as a uh, a career path model. A uh, an influencer, as you will, and saying that, well, why should I be mired down by a, a six year relationship like James Paul was with Jane Asher? I want to go out and I want to sell my wild oats on uh, whichever team uh, will have me. That's very interesting. And uh, concerning the name Paul, I also find it interesting that in the band Kiss, Ace Freely's first name is Paul. So Paul Freely changed his name from Paul to Ace. And Paul Stanley's real first name is Stanley. And uh, his real last name is Eisen. So Stanley Eisen changed his name to Paul Stanley. And when you think about that, when uh, when each of the members of KISS at the time put out their solo records, they thanked the other three members of KISS, um, or so we thought. But if in fact Ace is Paul, when he thanked Gene and uh, Paul and, uh, and Peter, um, was he thanking Paul Stanley or was he thanking himself and, and throwing a cold, hard disc to uh, Paul Stanley? Uh, I think that this is something for uh, one of our listeners to uh, write a letter about. We need to know the answer. I think we do need to know the answer to that. So all of you listeners out there in YouTube land, please, if you've got the answer to that, please send it in. We'd love to share your answer with ourselves, of course, so that we can be enlightened here on the show. But of course, we'd like to enlighten all of the folks out there in YouTube land as well. Now, very interesting stuff. We shall see what happens with Chris Paul. I did see a rumor that he might be going to the LA Lakers, but um, time will tell on that one, my friend and my friends, time will tell. And now, Moving on to the juiciest story of the show today, we've got some big news in the NHL. Folks who've been following the Stanley Cup uh, playoff games here have been probably uh, well informed of this. <clears throat> but uh, Fox 5 in Las Vegas recently reported that the Las Vegas Strip Club 
Larry Flint's Hustler Club just offered the Las Vegas Golden Knights free lap dances for life as an incentive for them to win the Stanley Cup. Now, I have to wonder how much of an incentive that is really, or is it more of a distraction? I suppose for the uh, for the married players, it's more of a, of a distraction, and for the single players, probably a bit more of an incentive. But let's uh, let's have a look here and see what Fox Five Vegas has to report about this. <clears throat> it says here that the uh, the strip club is offering the Golden Knights platinum VIP membership access and free lap dances for life, in hopes of a championship win. Now. The statement also went on to say that the offer is contingent on a Stanley Cup victory against the Florida Panthers. Duh. It also goes on to say that the success of the Vegas Golden Knights has played an integral role in boosting our community's morale. This was said by Brittany Rose, who is the general manager of Larry Flint's Hustler Club in Las Vegas. And Brittany also goes on to say, as the first professional sports team to debut in Las Vegas, we decided to show our support by extending free lap dances for life in efforts to hope, motivate, and lead the team to victory. Well, I happen to have a little bone to pick with that statement, Ringo Klecko, because the Golden Knights are not the first professional sports team to debut in Las Vegas. That honor goes to the aces of the WNBA. So I'm afraid, uh, Brittany Rose, you'll have to um, you'll have to sit corrected, as they say. But um, before I wax poetic about this big news story any further, Ringo Klecko, what do you make of all this? Well, what I do know, mate, is uh, despite the uh, squeaky clean persona that had been marketed by uh, Mr. Brian Epstein of the Beatles in the early and mid 60s, uh, no one was getting more lap dances than uh, John Ball, George and Ringo, uh, the uh, fabulous Beatles. And uh, I would think that uh, just like Mr. Billy Shears, who was an unknown, uh, I think he was uh, some sort of grave digger at the time, uh, decided that he wanted free lap dances. Um, he went up and he set up that motorcycle accident that uh, Paul McCartney had in uh, 1966. Obviously, he died there. And then they wrote all those songs and left all those clues. And then Billy, uh, Billy, uh, Billy Shears obviously looked just like Paul McCartney and sang just like Paul McCartney and wrote songs just like Paul McCartney, et cetera, et cetera, left handed like Paul McCartney and so forth. And uh, he was immediately put in the Beatles to get the free lap dances. So I think that uh, what uh, the, the uh, Brittany from the general manager of uh, Larry Flint's Hustler Club is uh, she's probably got some. Some, some kind of someone on her payroll who uh, looks perhaps like the uh, backup goalie of the Golden Knights. I don't know who that might be. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen him with his mask off, uh, but it'd be very easy to uh, insinuate yourself into uh, all of a uh, uh, fame and fortune and free lap dances by saying that uh, you're from a small town in Kosovo and uh, that uh, you are the backup goalie for the Golden Knights after you've, uh, uh, like Billy, she has had uh, that goalie uh, taken out and you've replaced him. Well, right you are, Ringo Klecko, but first things first, the Vegas Golden Knights have to win the Stanley Cup, otherwise that deal is null and void. What do you think their chances are now with the Golden Knights being up two games to one against the Panthers? Well, I think if you uh, look back at the classic episode one of Ringo Klecko Sports Report, uh, there was a similar circumstance between uh, the Golden Knights and the Dallas Stars. Uh, the Golden Knights were up... Uh, the three games to none and then there was three games to one three games to two and then the golden knights uh, won it in six now uh they were up two to nothing and uh they were uh uh i think two minutes away from winning game three and uh and it was tied up and then they lost game three so uh i still still think that uh there's definitely the possibility that the golden knights are uh are setting up uh the florida panthers in a way that uh, we would set up the Rolling Stones uh, every time that they thought that they had caught up to us. Well, then we would go in a different direction and uh, and then they would just do a, a silly retread of what we did um, until finally we broke up. And then they decided that uh, they had to make Taylor in the band and uh, let uh, Keith uh, really take control of the artistic direction with Exile on Main Street. So I think that pretty much sums that all up, which means Golden Knights win and uh, get the free lap dances. Excellent. I like that prediction. I also think Las Vegas will have a bigger celebration in terms of, uh, of of the citywide celebration if the Stanley Cup is won by the home team there, as opposed to in Florida, where if the Panthers win the Stanley Cup, I just can't see that particular Stanley Cup celebration <clears throat> being all that special. But um, so I'm going to go with your prediction. Ringo Klecko, I like 
the Golden Knights to win this series in six games. That's my big prediction. And you can take that to the bank, even if it's, you know, just your Monopoly board game bank. But anyway, take it to the bank. And on that note, I thank you all very much for joining us here today on this episode of Ringo Klecko Sports Report. I hope we brought you up to speed on all of the big news that's happening on the four major sports here in America. And um, Ringo Klecko, any pearls of wisdom for our listeners and viewers before we sign off? The rock and roll, everybody. What he said. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, mate. <clears throat> Very good.